Hey everyone, Walter Crosby with Helix Sales Development, your host of, sale, of Sales and Cigars. Uh, today, I always get crap from, from the audience about not explaining what I'm smoking. So today, it's a Rocky Patel Discipline. Um, it's a little heavier than what I normally smoke, but um, it's, it's quite nice. And I'm drinking uh, a little Penelope Valencia, which is really hard to find. So today's guest is Danielle Cobo. Um, it was a great conversation. She lays so much value at, at the feet of entrepreneurs and leaders, especially sales leaders. But if, if you're struggling to motivate your people to help them see the potential that, that you know they have, and, and they're struggling to, to, with the confidence to get there, she helps us with several little frameworks and some threads to pull through. Um, I, I really encourage you to spend the, the 30 minutes listening to this um, Go grab a cigar, grab a cocktail, strap in for another impactful episode of Sales and Cigars. Thanks. So, Daniel, welcome to the, the program. I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule to have a conversation. I am thrilled to be on the Sales and Cigars podcast. So thanks for having me. Thanks. Um, so I always ask this question. And I've gotten some good feedback on it. So I'm going to ask you, is there a book you gift or reread on a regular basis? There are two books that I gift or reread and enjoy um, thoroughly. I've made a very positive impact in my career. And the first one is 20 Days to the Top by Brian Sullivan. Okay. I read his book early on in my career, and it made a profound impact in my sales career. I read his book, and then the four consecutive years after reading the book, I earned President's Club for top sales performance. Right. Um, in fact, I recently just became a consultant for Bright for um, Precise Selling Formula, which I'm very excited about because... Uh, it, it really did make a positive impact. So it's definitely a book that I recommend, 20 Days to the Top by Brian Sullivan. Awesome. And then if somebody is stepping into a leadership role, one of the first books that was recommended to me when I became a leader, and I thoroughly recommend to others, is First Break All the world, All the Rules, What the World's Greatest Managers Do Differently. And that's by Marcus Buckingham and Kurt Kaufman. No. That one I have on my bookshelf, mm -hmm. I, I, but to be honest, I haven't read it. I've thumbed through it, but I haven't read it. So, and we have a lot of leaders that listen to this podcast. Like, is there something in there that like, you know, what's the one thing that would you, you would tell somebody that they should read this and how it might help them and impact them? I think, I mean, I read this years ago, so it's been a while, but I do remember something that stood out, which is don't make any changes within the first 90 days of taking over a team. So I read this book. I had been hired for a management position, but I had no direct management experience for a large pharmaceutical company. And I read this book within one week, right before my interview. Um, I had an interview for, it was with six of the executive leadership team, and it was a three-hour interview, and I had to present as to how I was going to be leading this team. It was one of the poorest performing teams in the nation. And what stood out was, is don't make any changes within the first 90 days. And the reason being is within the first 90 days, you're there to observe. You're there to learn. You're there to learn their business, their approach, their strengths the areas of opportunities, you're there to build trust. If you go in and you just start making changes right away, it's going to rub people the wrong way because they're going to think even though you come with all this experience in their minds, you don't know their business as well as they do. Yes. So that was something that always stood out in my mind. So I, I know that like when I work with people that are stepping into new leadership roles or they're taking over new teams or maybe the or the team has gone through a reorganization you got new mem members on your team really take those first 90 days to observe and learn and build relationships with your team that's awesome advice and that I, I i i've heard that in a different way from from other from other folks and i think it's it's sound because i i have a client right now that just brought in a new general manager 
And that is his approach. He's really being uh, asks a lot of questions. He's very pensive. He's it, 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 sometimes it's a little hard to read, but he's really he's really trying to understand what we're doing and then why we're doing that and what what's working and where do we need help. Right. It's sort of a, a this cadence that that I think he's mm -hmm. maybe he's read the book and um, maybe. he's bringing it, bringing it through. So that that gives you uh, that that gave you some support and helped you win that win that role, the, the, mm -hmm. that position. Yeah. So when I interviewed for that particular position, um, like I said, I had no direct management experience. I happened to be interviewing for an individual contributor role. And as I was interviewing, I was showing the hiring manager this business proposal that I had created for one of the organizations that I worked with. I was 25 years old. Uh, I was working for an organization where it was a capital equipment medical company and they didn't have a sales training program. And after reading the book 20 days to the top and i saw what a positive impact having actual sales training would make um i realized like this was a huge opportunity within our organization that i could see the value in us in the growth and so i created this business proposal it had the title of the position which was national director of sales training the roles and responsibilities it was an outline compensation plan um tagged to the overall growth of um, the organization, but also the attainment of the new hires within the six months and one year. And so I had this biz this business proposal that I created. Now they ended up creating the position for that organization, but I happened to have left before they created it because um, I was recruited to another organization. But as I was interviewing for this individual contributor role, I was presenting this business proposal and the hiring manager asked me, she said, would you be interested in a leadership role? And I said, absolutely, I'd love to, but I also recognize I don't have like direct leadership experience. I've mentored people, I've coached people, mm -hmm. but I didn't have that direct management experience. And she says, well, would you consider doing it anyways? And I said, absolutely. So I had about a week to prepare and I read, uh, I reached out to managers that I knew. I scheduled one-on-one -on -one calls with them. I asked, I would do like an hour call with different managers that I had built relationships with over the years. I'd ask them different questions about what it means to be a leader. Uh, what do they feel like are the skill sets? What are some of the misconceptions? What are some things I may not know about? And I interviewed all these managers and then one of them had mentioned this book. And so I read this book within the week before the interview and then I interviewed and I got the position. Awesome. But, but you went through... I mean, you were preparing for what you're doing now back when you're in your mid-20s. Yeah. Right? Which wasn't that long ago, but it, it you started that process. 20 years ago. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you shared, not me. Um, but, I mean, but, but, but you had that sort of built into your DNA to mm -hmm. like be curious, to, to be looking for ways to improve upon and, and fill gaps. And, and that's what I, what I look at. And I, and I, th I think it kind of ties in with what you were saying is if, if I would, if I go in and start to look at a team and I'm going to spend, you know, 90 days evaluating and understanding and, and really gathering the, the information about what they're doing well, I'm looking for the little gaps, right? Cause they're doing a lot of things well, usually. And mm -hmm. what's the little things that we can tweak that doesn't change and upset the apple cart, but it just gets them to to start to head in a different direction, just just a little bit. And I and I think those are the things that um, that that I wish I had that information when I got my first manager's role because I like you, like I why are you giving me this job? I don't know. I've never done this before, right? And they're like, well, you're you're a good salesperson, top performer. Yeah, but what does that have to do with anything? Right. Not always a top performer leads to the best manager. Uh, it's a very different skill sets. It it is, and it took it took a lot of time and patience on everybody's part for me to start to figure that out, like how to coach people and how to you know how to ask the right questions. What helped me in a, at a very high level is it, it's a lot like selling, in in the sense that you're if you go in curious and you go in with a little bit of skepticism and asks a lot of questions and and look for those opportunities. Um, it, it's the leadership part that I've, I've always struggled with 
And I'm just, I'm being really honest. And that's one of the reasons why I was excited to talk to you about today. And we'll kind of get to that in a minute. But um, so you were in sales and then you mm-hmm. you, you moved into a, a, a manager leadership role. Talk a little bit about like how you progressed through that and to get to where you are today. Because you had a sales foundation. Yeah, the sales foundation. So I started my career in medical sales. Well, my whole career has been in medical sales. I started in dental sales uh, where I was in dental sales for five years. That's where I earned the four consecutive President's Clubs Awards for top performance. Then I transitioned into medical aesthetics. um, And most recently, I was a senior sales manager for Fortune 500 organization in the medical aesthetic industry. And um, in that role, it was very unique in the sense that I remember one manager telling me early on when I was first in leadership, and they said, what you've experienced within your first two years in leadership is what most managers don't experience within their first 10. And the reason being is, is within the first two years of me being in a leadership role, the company that I was with had been acquired. We had acquired another organization and we had gone through an attempted hostile takeover from our competitor where if the company had taken us over, he was secretly buying shares um, and trying to take us over, it would have created a monopoly within our industry. And so it ended up going to court. They ended up squashing it. They couldn't do the takeover. Um, We ended up being acquired by a larger organization. But you know, I went through restructuring where I lost four out of the eight people on my team within the first two years of me taking over a leadership position. I relocated from the south, the Southern California to the Southeast region. Um, I, we had acquired companies. Companies had acquired us. We had gone through expansions. We had gone through downsizing. So really talking about being agile and adaptable and uh, resilient were some resilient. of the skills that I learned. Mm-hmm. Early on, as a leader, I mean that—that's a really good description. Like, you—you you got ten years and two years of, of experience, and that you know that, that's why resilience is a thread that I, um, that, you know, as I see when I look at your your digital footprint, that's a big part of um, being able to with, withstand all that chaos. Is that a good mm-hmm. word for? Um, I mean, it definitely is- felt chaotic because anytime that there's acquisitions, restructuring, there's a lot of unknown and there's a lot of assumptions and a lot of rumors and rumors can create chaos within an organization. And so, yeah, I agree that chaos would probably be a word to describe going through many of those challenges. But, I mean, you're testing your resiliency, you're testing your confidence, you're, you're testing your abilities to navigate that and learn how to uh, communicate with with different folks at different times about different things um that's a, a so so you you work through all that and then you decided to to go do this on your own to to hang your own shingle as they say is that <laughs> yeah so i uh, it's interesting because i look back and i go wow i really did even though the company that i had proposed that business proposal for the National Director of Sales Training, even though they had created the position after I had left the organization, I ultimately ended up doing the position because that's what I do now, but as my own business owner. And it's been extremely rewarding. Um, There was a series of events that took place in 2020 um, where I just felt like I was called to do something different. Uh, My husband in 2019, he served a year deployment in Iraq. At the time, I was leading a team across five states. I was traveling every single week while my kids were between the ages of one and a half and two and a half years old. Holy crap. Talk about chaos. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I would say organized chaos. Uh, I knew going into that year that I was going to need to be very intentional with my time. And so, you know, I was – and I was very – I was very fortunate. We had a full-time nanny. My mother, my in-laws moved across the street from us. So they were always, when I was traveling for work, There was they were either always with my in-laws, my nanny, or at sometimes I flew my parents out. So they were always stability for my kids. Um, and I was just very intentional about my time and where I spent my time with and who I said yes to and who I said no, not at this moment right now. Yeah. Um, and so he comes back from deployment It was difficult while he was gone. What I did not anticipate was the returning home, 
we were very different people. He had just come from a war zone. He's used to directing soldiers in high stakes environment. I'm used to um, having a conversation with toddlers that, you know, when he left, they were in cribs, they were drinking out of bottles, they were learning to walk. He comes back and they're sleeping in toddler beds and they're okay. formulating blatant sentences and have opinions. He wasn't used to them having opinions on what they wanted to eat and not eat. He's like, what is this? Right. Uh, and so he comes back from deployment and that really kind of shifted my perspective on what I wanted out of life and where I wanted to be. I didn't want to be on the road as much as I was. Um, and then unfortunately, uh, a couple months later, I had lost my mom um, and that mm. really was devastating. And then the pandemic hit, that was a week after losing my mom. And then right after that, the company that I had been with for seven years got acquired by another organization and it became a very toxic work environment. I mean, there are people there that have been there for 25, 30 years, 15 years that ended up leaving the organization. And so all of these events that transpired within a six month period, I really took a step back and looked at myself in the mirror one day and said, what do I want to be known for? Like, what do I want my legacy to be? What brings me the most joy? And I love the coaching and the development. I did not love the administrative work. I didn't love being on the road all the time as much as I was. Um, I felt like a lot of what I was doing sometimes in corporate was doing more of the administrative work than it was just the coaching and development. Mm -hmm. And so I said, how can I just lean in more into what do I enjoy doing? And that's what sparked me creating this business. Um, I've been doing it for about four years. I help either individuals uh, attract their dream job. So I help them with resume writing, interview coaching. Um, I help them with getting promoted. So what are the skill sets they need to get promoted? Or I work with individuals and organizations on leadership development and sales training. So I've had, and it's been so rewarding because I've had clients who have been promoted. I've had clients who have earned President's Club, multiple clients who have earned President's Club for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, organizations that I've done leadership trainings and to see multiple people get promoted within the organization. It's been such a rewarding segment of my career that I have just been so fulfilling. Thanks for being part of another uh, fun episode of Sales and Cigars. Let me ask you a question. Are you tired of struggling to hire sales talent that's going to move the needle for your company? Well, maybe you should attend my Sales Hiring Secrets program and discover the number one mistake that business owners are making with hiring sales talent in your organization. The details are in the show notes. Click on the page, it gives you all the details. It gives you everything you need to know to uh, solve the problem of sales talent on your team. Thanks. It, it's a, um, I appreciate that story. I, it, to me, we're running a business, so we, we need to earn income and create revenue, right? That goes without saying. But the, the thing that gets us out of bed in the morning, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I, I, it, it's that it's those days when that that individual that you've been working with, that has been maybe been struggling, but finally takes a step forward and they they call you and say, you know, that deal we were working on it closed and it, you know, it's better than what we thought or they get the promotion. Um, I have one sales guy who calls me like when he's on his way in the car on the way home from the week. And he tells me all these stories about how, you know, how much and he's having fun. Mm -hmm. right? And, and those are the things that like, you know, I always tell him, like, you made my you made my day. Right. Because, mm -hmm. you know, he's not he's not giving me it's not the praise. It's just like watching somebody win. That's yeah, the point. that's really the uh, you know, what do you want to be known for? It's like it's helping people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, reach their, reach their dreams. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. knowing that they can do something that they're not quite sure that they can do. And we believe in it more than they do. And then they go do it watching that, that expression on their face or the sound of their voice. That's, that's the, that's the real joy. It's helping them build confidence and whether that's confidence in pursuing a new position or whether it's confidence in going after um, a new sales opportunity. But when you can help somebody build their confidence, it creates a ripple effect within themselves in multiple areas in their life, but it also creates a ripple effect at home as well. Mm -hmm. 
because they start showing up more confident in all areas of their life. And then they start building relationships with people at home. You know, like you think about somebody who is lacking confidence and they're drained with work and they're not enjoying their work. How are they going to be showing up at home? And how is that going to be affecting the people that they're um, interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis? versus somebody who's, I love my job, I'm confident in what I'm doing, I'm gonna, they're gonna stand a little bit taller, they're gonna be more enjoyable to be around at home. It's that ripple effect that you get to create when you get to really help somebody achieve their goals and build their confidence. And, and that's, that's all true. It's, it's whatever, like if you're, it's that old adage where people had a bad day, they come home and wanna kick the dog, right? But it, it's, mm -hmm. it goes beyond that. It's, you're, I had a I had a job that I did really well in. It was financially rewarding, mm -hmm. but I hated every moment of it. Mm -hmm. And my wife said, "Like, why are you doing this?" And I'm like, look at the numbers, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? I mean, she said, that's not a reason to do it. That's not. And she's right. Um, and it, you know, she gave me the space to go do something different. Um, and you know, so I. I owe her that to with what I put into this to be able to, um, you know, to, to live my dream because she let me, she, you know, gave me that permission, if you will, right. And told me that I didn't have to do that. And I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are stuck in that, um, in that environment. So you talk about gaining confidence and I, and I truly believe that that thread will run through your whole life, friends, family, mm -hmm your your work any volunteer work that you're doing it'll all it'll all kind of multiply but like how do you help somebody that is struggling that they just don't believe they can do the mm -hmm. next thing that they need to do is there a, a magic wand or is there some some framework or structure that you you use without giving away all your secrets yeah. So there's a lot of frameworks that I go through in my book. Um, I, the My book, Unstoppable Grit, it's it leads with each chapter leads with a story, the learning lessons and practical advice and exercises that the reader can apply to their life to help them better themselves. And um, a lot of times what people forget is they forget every, they forget the accomplishments that they've, uh, the accomplishments that they've made along the way to get them to where the point that they're at now. And so, you know, when I'm working with somebody, whether they're looking for a new job or whether they're in sales, like, let's talk about some of the challenges that you've experienced in life. And what steps did you take to get over them? And I'm like, and, and, and they'll kind of like downplay them. And they'll kind of, you know, they'll, they'll say, mm -hmm. oh, but that's not that big of a deal. I'm like, no, 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 don't discredit. Um, what you accomplished because a lot of times our strengths come so natural us that sometimes we'll say oh well it's not that big of a deal or everybody does it. i'm like no 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 that's a strength that a lot of people wish that they had that you have so let's really leverage that particular strength i'll often say too your imperfect is somebody's perfect wow your imperfect is somebody's perfect. So a lot of times we'll get caught in the comparison trap of saying, well, that person's more successful. They have more skill sets. And I say, yes, and they do have those skill sets. But what skill sets do you have that they don't have? What is it that people see in you? And if you don't know what that is, one simple exercise that I did early on when I was really trying to go through this period of self-reflection and um, is... I went on Facebook one day and I said, if there was two words that you could use to describe me, what would it be? And people were saying motivating, inspiring, empowering, grit, resilience, um, driven. And I'm going, wow, if this is what people are seeing in me and I'm not seeing it in myself, then I'm doing myself a disservice. But were you not seeing yourself in, those, in, the, in that light, in those words? I was but not to the level that other people were. I think that I, I had gone through that six month period where there was so much chaos and uncertainty and devastation with losing my mom and, and the toxic work environment, how the toxicity was affecting my mental health, that I was losing confidence during that six month period. And so it was just a little bit to remind me that I'm 
that I'm so much more than I give myself credit for. And everybody else is so much more than they often give themselves credit for. It, it, is that, and I mean, you know, maybe you, you probably have an opinion on this. Maybe you have hmm? some, some insights, but it, that's pretty common. Right, because you very you, common. You were describing like, what do you do well? And say, yeah, well, that wasn't that big of a deal. I, I, I could hear myself saying, yeah, that's not that big of a deal. I, I, everybody does that, and I think if we just realize the things that, as a leader, if we can help draw that out, as a manager, if we can help draw that out of our team, that you know, when they're when they're in a in a slump, or when they're just struggling to to get to the next level. It's helping them see that they have within them what it takes to do it and sort of kind of bestow this confidence on them. But they got to pick up the baton and take it too, right? Mm -hmm. They got to believe. They do. It. They do. And, and, and think about is, you know, in those situations when somebody is lacking confidence, we thrive on positive reinforcement. We thrive on affirmations. And so it's one thing for us to try to tell ourselves that, but when other people sell, say it, that's where it really builds the confidence. So I believe it's beneficial whether it's you're hearing it from a manager, a colleague, or you're working with a career coach, but somebody other than you to show you what you may not be seeing yourself. And those of us who, th who, who think we don't need to hear that, we're probably wrong, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's been so many studies out there that say, you know, we we thrive on positive reinforcement. We thrive on hearing what we're doing well. If we hear what we're doing well, we're going to do more of it. And, and, and that hasn't changed like when we were little kids, right? The positive affirmations, the, uh, um, the admonishments when we do something wrong, but the positive rewarding of, of just a smile. I read I read something about like how even an infant can recognize a positive a smile the 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 facial expressions of their parents and that helps them motivate themselves as as even as infants the brain mm -hmm. working that way um, even as as little people um, and that doesn't change as we get older it just becomes more complicated. To, to get no, I mean, there is a, a couple a couple weeks ago, I was just having a rough day. I think my parent, my kids, my kids were acting up. They were just running around Walgreens. And I was just exhausted. And um, I always like to say that my six-year-old twins have more energy than a squirrel on a triple espresso. Like that's the energy levels that they have. And Ooh. I remember walking out of Walgreens and this teenage girl looked at me and she says, I hope you're having a great day. And it's interesting because her friend was like, well, why did you say that to a random stranger? And I happened to be wearing my sweatshirt um, of the church that I go to when we go to the same church. And she said, well, she's wearing the sweatshirt from the church that we go to. So we go to the same church. But I remember walking away going, wow, I was having such a bad day. But just hearing from a stranger, I hope you're having a great day, just gave me just a little bit boost of just happiness. Like it felt good to be seen and heard and acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So even more powerful. I mean that. I mean that just landed for you at the right time, and it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's we can rationalize that in a bunch of different ways as to why it happened. But mm -hmm. it happened, and it gave you that little giddy up in your step for what you needed to go corral the uh, the, the twins. Um, yes, boys. Yes, I have twin boys. <laughs> I I have a daughter. When she was little, we went. She had mostly girlfriends, and we went to a boys' party where it, where it was mostly boys. And, mm -hmm. I, and I was, I, 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 I just didn't know what to do because there was all of this energy running around. And my daughter looked at me. She's like, "Dad, it's like crazy." And I'm like, "Well, they're, they're, they got a lot of energy, so yeah. we're gonna have to figure out a way to to get in there and mix it up." Um, she she did. It took her a minute, but. I was just like the boy, a boy energy and girl energy at that level is wildly different. I don't know how you do it. Um, well, and, and I say too, they're the kids of the bloodline of a Black Hawk pilot. My husband's an adrenaline seeking Black Hawk pilot. 
And then there's me, who's just like very go-getter type personality. So they've got two parents that are very go-getters. And then they feed off of each other too, because they're the same age. So oftentimes they'll go to school, they'll go to after school care, they'll go to karate, and then they'll come home and we'll build obstacle courses in the house to try to burn out the rest of the energy. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot, that's a lot of that's a lot of energy. And that and that's probably not gonna go away as they get older. It's just gonna get bigger. Um, yeah, just hopefully just big, <laughs> definitely involved in sports. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's, it's giving that as a leader to really install that confidence in our team, it, it's helping them. Sometimes we have to help them see the things that they can't see for themselves and help them, help them see that they've accomplished a lot and that they, they, they have within them what they need to do. And that's really the job of a coach, right? Is to help, help somebody see the things that we know that they can do. Um, and and go accomplish it that where they're they have that self doubt um, and you know a lot of a lot of um we talk obviously there you want to highlight their strengths and there's always going to be times where there's areas of opportunity or maybe some areas that you want to focus on that they need to develop and I'm a big believer instead of feedback providing feed forward coaching and so what that sounds like is I noticed you did X Y Z in that business meeting. Um, if you were to do ABC, you will achieve these goals. So let's say, for example, I noticed in that meeting, you did a great job going through the features and benefits of the product. If you were to ask some questions before going into the features and benefits, you might be able to better understand what's important to them and be a little more honed in on what benefits are going to best are going to best support their their immediate needs so it's that if you do i notice you did this if you do this you will achieve that type coaching and do you give them the like in that scenario you know from a sales perspective do you, do you help them see that that shortens their sales cycle that gives them uh speed in the in the process or do you, do you just let them start to figure that out? Well, I'll open a discussion. So anytime I go on a, fo a field co-travel with somebody on my team, I'll say, okay, let's get in the car. What did we do well? What are three things that we did really well in that appointment? Mm -hmm. What are two things that maybe didn't go so well in that appointment? Maybe we weren't as prepared. Maybe we didn't ask any questions, whatever, you know, whatever it is. And then maybe what are two things that we would do differently mm -hmm. if given the opportunity to have that appointment again? I believe that in life and in business, we get so focused on going forward and working towards our goal that we don't take a step back to reflect on what is currently going on. So in business, if we don't take a step back and take a pause and go, what's really working in my business? What's not working in my business? What are maybe some things I should do differently in my business? That's where the growth comes from. And I used to do that as a manager. As a manager, every quarter my team would get together and I would give a marker, it'd be a, a whiteboard and a dry erase marker to somebody. And I said, okay, I want you guys to write down one person's gonna transcribe for confidentiality purposes. I want you to transcribe what what um what should I start doing as a leader and what should we start doing as a team? What should we stop, what should I stop doing as a leader? And what should we stop doing as a team? And what should I continue doing? And what should as a team we continue doing? And I would walk out of the room and however long it took for them, sometimes it'd be 10 minutes, sometimes it'd be a half hour. And I walk back in the room and then they would tell me exactly what those answers are. Um, because I believe that it's so important to really look at who we are in our business and find areas to grow but also really highlight those, the things that are working well. I mean, it starts with vulnerability as a leader and the manager doing that. Absolutely. And, it, Absolutely. and then it, it allows everybody else to feel comfortable sharing. And, and then, but then we have to go make those, make those changes, make sure we really understand what it is that we're looking for, what they're looking for and make the adjustments as, as we can um, to, to keep, 
to keep progressing and to to make progress in those in those areas. That's a, those those are some some great ideas for um, the leaders out there to to kind of work into their system. I love the well, better, different. All right, and there's various ways that you can implement those, um, and it gives you so much flexibility. Whether you're doing a debrief or a pre-call plan, um, it, it, all of it, it, it works just about anywhere in any type of coaching environment. Um, so I, I'm never going to ask my team to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. Yep. And in sales, a lot of sales managers will do field co-travels and they'll provide feedback. But sometimes it feels like they're always, as a sales rep, as a sales representative, it feels like I'm always the one receiving the feedback. When do I get an opportunity to give my manager feedback? And so when the manager is willing to be vulnerable and willing to say, hey, I want your guys' feedback, it creates a different dynamic in a relationship. It becomes a two-way street, not a one-way street. And also, too, by asking, what are the things you want to start doing? It's getting us focused on problem-solving solutions, not just, um, not just a complaining session. It's like, okay, here's what I'm not doing. Well, what could I be doing differently? Right. It, it forces them to think about the, the solution that they want rather than just throw out the problem and, and yep. at your feet. And now you got to figure it out. Um, I love it. It's all great. So um, can you share with the audience, you know, your book, um, you, you shared a few ideas from it um, as to who it would help, but from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, somebody that's running a business, they've reached a certain point and they're trying to get to the next level and they really need to get their team to buy into their vision, right? Is there is there a piece of a section in the book that that would be something that would be applicable? And where do they go get the book, right? Yes. Tell them. So the book Unstoppable Grit, how to break through or break through the seven roadblocks standing between you and achieving your goals. Chapter nine, I tell the story of the time that I lost four out of the eight people on my team in one day. But here's the caveat to that story. I had no idea what was happening. The call that, yep, I received, I was on a field code travel with a member of my team. I got a call from my manager and, it, and he said, just two statements. You have a job, but don't answer your phone today. That's it. And then hung up. And so here I am in a business meeting with a, a member of my team. We go in the business meeting, we step out of the business meeting, we go back into the car and we go through those, you know, we're kind of going through the coaching session of, okay, what went well in the appointment? What would we do differently? Da, da, da. And my phone is just like constantly ringing and ringing and ringing, but I'm not supposed to answer it. And my team member looks at me and she goes, aren't you going to answer that? And I'm like, oh, you know, no, this is, this is our quality time. I'll, I'll respond to these messages on my way home. And then her phone starts ringing and she's like, do you mind if I answer it? Selfishly, I'm kind of like, yeah, please do. I want to know what's going on. <laughs> well, um, the first call was from uh, a girl on my team who had been with the organization for over five years. She was really like my my hero, my my leader on the team. She was somebody that I could always go to to get a pulse of what's going on with a team. Mm -hmm. And on the other line, I hear from her, "I've just been let go." Wow. Then a second call comes in because, of course, then they find out I'm with this individual. So then they just start calling her. So then I hear from another person on the other line. Now, this person was my newest new hire. She was a resilient single mother who had just been with the company for just a couple months. She had just been let go. Then there was another person who had been on sabbatical leave battling breast cancer. And she had been let go. So I had lost four out of the eight people on my team in one day. I had no idea it was happening. The four other remaining people, their territories all changed. And so in the book, I tell the story, but then I talk about how can you effectively lead yourself and how can you effectively lead a team through change? But the cool thing is about this particular um, chapter is I break it down in three sections what to do as the individual, what to do as a sales manager, and what to do if you're an entrepreneur. Because as an entrepreneur, we go through changes too. Like if an organization goes through layoffs, 
maybe they're not going to be in it. Maybe they're going to be doing other cuts to businesses that they work with as well. So I break it down into three different sections. I love it. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. So mm-hmm. Unstoppable Grit, they get it wherever they get books. They get it from your yep, website. Amazon. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. I love it. Uh, and I would encourage people to go out and take a look at that. I know um, I'm going to go grab a copy because there's a couple of chapters I think that can help me um, with my uh, upping my skills in certain areas. Um, so I thank you for um, for sharing these, these wonderful frameworks and ideas. So last question, Danielle, relationship with cigars, because you're, you're in the Tampa area, pretty close to Ybor City. Any, I am. Any, any relationship past or present with cigars? So I am married to somebody who is half Cuban. So cigars are a part of the culture. My father-in-law is an immigrant from Cuba. He came on the Peter Pan flights when he was 11 years old, lived in an orphanage until he was 13, hmm. and then became a general surgeon one a very prominent general surgeon in the United States. So he is truly what it embodies American living dream. the American dream. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why my husband joined the military is he wanted to give back to the country that gave to our, to his family. Mm. So, um, yeah, the, it, they smoke cigars. It's part of, you know, I have cigar boxes that are on my bookshelf over here. I've got a humidor. I don't smoke cigars. It's not my thing, but, um, it just oh. always kind of remind. Anytime I see a cigar, I think of my father-in-law, my husband. That's that's a great story. I appreciate that. Um, mm-hmm. And the 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 Cuban immigrant. My wife is German, and one of her cousins, who are both one hundred percent German, she married a, a, a Cuban first generation American. And it's fun to be sort of this observer of the Cuban culture with the German culture. And the hugging and the loud and the, it's it's completely yeah. different, um, but they persevere, right? They just like we're gonna we're gonna be a family, and it, it's mm-hmm. it's so fun to watch um, the the and and whenever I get to go over there, uh, you know, Manny and his dad and I go out onto the to the deck and have a cigar and look mm-hmm. over the Hudson. It's a it's it's a it's a fun thing. So um, yeah. that's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, I, again, thank you for 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 joining us. Lots of great information. Um, uh, you know, for folks that, who out there want a little bit uh, more information, go to your website. That'll be in the show notes. They can reach out to you and and dig in a little deeper. Yes, and so? connect with me on LinkedIn. Cool. Thank you, Danielle. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Thank you.